If you have a relationship with someone, it's predicated on trust. And part of the reason for that is that trust is what enables us to look at each other without running away screaming. And what I mean by that is that if I trust you, then I don't have to take into account how complicated you are because you're horribly complicated. You know, I think chimpanzee full of snakes, that's what a human being is. And, and as long as you'll do what you say you'll do, then I can take you at your word, and your word simplifies you, and you can take me at my word, and my word simplifies you, and then we can act like we understand each other even though we don't. But then if that trust is betrayed, then all the snakes come forth very, very rapidly. And so, you, you, all of you, I suspect, have been betrayed one way or another. And so, what happens, if, if you're in a relationship with someone and you trust them, then you make certain assumptions about the past, and you make certain assumptions about the present, and you make certain assumptions about the future. And everything's stable, and so you're standing on solid ground. And, and the chaos, it's like you're standing on thin ice. The chaos is hidden. The, the shark beneath the waves isn't there. You're, you're safe, you're in the lifeboat. But then if the person betrays you, like if you're in an intimate relationship and the person has an affair and you find out about it, then, then you think, one moment you're one place, right? You're, you're where everything is secure because you've predicated your perception of the world on the axiom of trust. And the next second, really, the next second, you're in a completely different place. And not only is that place different right now, the place you were years ago is different, and the place you're going to be in the future years hence is different. And so all of that certainty, that strange certainty that you inhabit can collapse into incredible complexity. And you say, well, if someone betrays you, you think, well, okay, who were you? Because you weren't who I thought you were, and I thought I knew you, but I didn't know you at all. And I never knew you, and so all the things we did together, those weren't the things that I thought were happening, something else was happening, and you're, you were someone else, and that means I'm someone else because I thought I knew what was going on, and clearly I don't, I'm some sort of blind sucker, or the, or the victim of a psychopath, or someone who's so naive that they can barely live, and I don't understand anything about human beings, and I don't understand anything about myself, and I have no idea where I am now, I thought I was at home, but I'm not, I'm in a house, and it's full of strangers, and I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, or next week, or next year. It's like all of that certainty, that habitable certainty, collapses right back into the potential from which it emerged. And that's a terrifying thing. That's a journey to the underworld from a mythological perspective. And that is really something worth knowing. You trust when you're naive because you don't know you can get hurt. And that's not ethical, that's not moral, it's not laudable, it's just naivety. Once you know you can be hurt, you trust as a courageous decision, knowing that if you trust someone, you can bring out the best in them, and knowing that if you don't, you'll never see it. So it's a calculated risk, and it's an intelligent, calculated risk designed to move you and the other person to, to the best. So you, you can tell yourself that, I'm going to take a risk. I might get hurt, but I'm going to take a risk, knowing it's a risk. It's a reasonable risk. Don't be a fool, but it's a reasonable risk. Um, and, re and remember that you have some reason to be afraid of intimacy and closeness, but you know you should also see both of those as um, positives on your side. To be intimate with someone means that you can share your thoughts with them and think things through with them, and you can share your triumphs and your disappointments and all of that. You broaden out your life. You broaden out your ability to solve problems. Um, you increase the probability, all things considered, that you're going to remain sane because two people who are communicating are generally saner than one person who is only thinking by themselves. Dante's Inferno, it's a very interesting story. It's a descent into hell. Right? And it's, it's actually one of the places that we sort of derive the popular conception of hell, it's partly based on Dante's, on Dante's imagination, on his work. And what Dante was trying to do was to discover the hierarchical structure of evil. And, you know, you might think there's a hierarchical structure of good, some things are better than other things, but there's also a hierarchical structure of evil. Some evils are greater than other evils. And he put betrayal in, in, in the lowest part of hell. Right? So if you were betraying people, you were right beside Satan himself. And so, and I think that's good, that's very smart. Well, Dante is a genius, after all. Um, and I think the reason for that is that See, if someone trusts you, they're laying their vulnerability open to you. Now, they might just be naive, let's say, and that's, you won't think about that, because you're just a child if you're naive. 
you can still be betrayed. But if you're an adult and you trust, it's often because you, if you're an actual adult, it's you willingly open yourself up, knowing that you could be hurt, right? Because you're not naive anymore. So you decide to trust and you say, I'll open myself up. And I know that I'm laying myself open to you if you choose to use that power. And then that's a good thing to know, you know, if you've been hurt as a child or hurt as a naive person, you might say, well, why should I ever trust again? Which is a really good question. And the answer is the reason you trust again once you're an adult is because you're courageous. You're, you're courageous. It's an act of courage to trust. And the reason it's useful is because if you trust someone, you open the door to reciprocity and negotiation and cooperation, and you entice the best part of the person forward. And so it's a, it's a courageous act. But then if you betray someone, then what you've done is you've taken the best part of them, which is the part that will courageously trust, you know, with open eyes, right? And you've stuck a dagger in them. And so you purposefully damaged the best part of them. And so that's why it's such an egregious fault. And, and it's often people don't recover from that sort of thing. If you betray someone badly enough, you can, you can damage them like you can give them post-traumatic stress disorder if you really if you really put your mind to it and you know that's not just a psychological disorder if you have post-traumatic stress disorder it produces permanent neurological alterations that make you more neurotic more sensitive to negative emotion really for the rest of your life like you can you can recover from it to some degree but stress will tend to re-instantiate the PTSD so you, you hurt someone, and it's not merely psycho not, not that psychological is merely, but it's not merely psychological. It's, it's fundamental physiological damage. I read, it, wrote, read a very interesting book a while back called The Wealth and Poverty of Nations that was written by a Harvard emeritus professor of history. And one of the things that he claimed, I liked it, I thought it was very smart, was that the only true natural resource is interpersonal trust. If you can set up a society where people trust each other, then it will instantly become rich. And he used the example of Japan, which is a very conscientious society and very rich society, but the Japanese have no natural resources, right? None to speak of, and yet they're rich. And then you have countries like the Soviet Russia and, and much of South America, where there's just natural resources that, you know, they're just like Venezuela, it's just more natural resources than you know what to do with. And, the places are absolute catastrophes, absolute catastrophes of cynicism and corruption. And so he attempted to document the relationship between default interpersonal trust among citizens within countries and their, their productivity and their, their GDP and their, their standard of living and found a very, very tight relationship. And, and I like that a lot. And I've got a story about that quickly that I think is very interesting. I'll tell you two stories, one sort of generic. Um, well, I'll tell you one personal first. So one day, I lent my car to one of my graduate students, and he took it to Montreal. It was this old Cadillac, and uh, it was a really bad rainstorm in Montreal, and it was in one of the highways that are, like, set into the ground, and it was, like, six inches of water, and he was turning a corner, hit the brakes, and skidded on the water, and smacked it into the wall, and on the corner of the, of the bumper. You know? And so then he brought it back, and he was very apologetic about it. And, and uh, his name was Matt Shane tell you that because Matt might hear this and I can shame him a bit for doing this, this 20 years ago you know and uh, he's a professor at uh, in the Ontario Institute of Technology I think now and quite a successful one but anyways he brought the car back and I went and got it evaluated for damages it was like $1,700 or something to repair it and or maybe more but it was almost as much as the car was worth and I thought well I'm not gonna do that so I went online and I typed in the part, and uh, if you do that, you can get people to bid on sending you a used part from all over North America. So that's kind of cool. So there's all these junk dealers have got together and they have this you know, network of communication. So you put in the car part and then they send you a bid. And so this guy said, uh, well, I'll send you the bumper assembly, which is the whole bumper and the lights for like 250 bucks. And I thought, yeah, okay, you, you can do that. That'd be good. So then I said, yes. And then he called me up about half an hour later, this guy from way down south, he had a really deep sort of Mississippi accent. He said, wait a sec, was that for the bumper or the bumper assembly? And I said, well, it was for the bumper assembly. He said, oh, I thought it was for the bumper. And then he said, but that's okay, I'll send it to you anyways. I thought, 
oh, that's pretty good. So I said, well, thank you. And then I hung up. And then half an hour later, he called me up again. And he said, look, I just went out and looked at that bumper assembly. And there's a plastic trim piece on the side. And it has a scratch in it. And I thought I'd better tell you that just in case you, you didn't want it. And I thought, wow, that's so amazing. It's like, there's a miracle, man. It's like this guy, he's somewhere in Mississippi. I'm never going to see him again, ever. Never going to have any contact with him. Like, he made a bad deal, right? Because the part was worth more than he decided to sell it to me for. But he stuck with his deal. And then he went over and above the call of duty. He said, well, this part that I'm selling you to you for way less than it's worth is damaged. So I thought I'd better tell you. It's like, man, you, you got to recognize a miracle when you see one. That was a miracle. So I, I said, hey, look, it's, thanks for calling, man. It's okay. I can handle the scratch and the part. And he did. And, and I got the car fixed and forgave Matt. And, you know, it had a happy ending. So, so that's trust, right? Because I didn't know him from Adam. And he's a primate full of snakes, just like the rest of us. And yet he was willing to simplify himself to the point where I could just take him absolutely at his word. And that meant we could trade even though we were strangers. It's like, man, do not underestimate the utility of that. And then there's eBay. So when eBay first started, you know, the idea was it's not going to work. Because you'll send me junk and I'll send you a check that bounces and that'll be the end of eBay, right? And so these escrow agents popped up so you could insure your transaction with them it was for like 10% of the transaction. They would get the check and the goods and make sure that they were okay and then send them on or insure the transaction. But what happened was the escrow agents didn't make any money. And the reason for that was no one cheated. Now you think about how amazing that is, right? You bring these people together across a whole continent. They've never seen each other before. They're never going to interact with each other again. And this was before there were any reputation ratings on eBay. And yet the default transaction was, you describe your goods honestly, including their flaws. You set a reasonable price. I decide to pay you. You ship the goods and I pay you. And it works. And what happened was that eBay produced, uh, it produced a tremendous amount of capital that was previously frozen. So frozen capital is when you've invested money in something. The thing is no longer useful to you, so the money is just sitting there frozen, right, so to speak. And you can't get it loose because, well, you've got an attic full of junk. How are you going to get rid of that? Oh, eBay. And so all of a sudden, all these things that were just junk became valuable and everybody got richer. And none of that wouldn't, would have happened without the covenant that we established between each other that's predicated on trust. And so you might say that trust is the currency. And currency is trust because it's a promissory note. Right? And if people lie, then the currency gets debased very, very rapidly. And so the economy runs on trust.